I'd like to give you an introduction into a reaction called the Sharpless Asymmetric Epoxidation. This method was developed by Barry Sharpless, who um, shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2001 with Knowles and Noyori. Um, all three of these chemists were um, recognized for their work in asymmetric synthetic methods. And actually, Dr. Sharpless and I go way back. Uh, I met him in Orlando at the ACS meeting last year. So uh, this method was introduced in 1980. Uh, he published an article in JAX called The First Practical Method for Asymmetric Epoxidation. And uh, there's a picture of it here. So what we have is an allylic alcohol. That's the substrate that uh, undergoes a, the, the epoxidation reaction. And for the uh, reactive ingredients, we have uh, diethyl tartrate, which is the source of chirality. So this is a naturally occurring compound. Um, tartaric acid uh, is this four carbon substrate in the middle here. And this is the diethyl ester of tartaric acid. So it's called diethyl tartrate. And the plus enantiomer is the naturally occurring one. And this forms a complex with titanium isopropoxide. Uh, in the method introduced in 1980, both of these catalysts were used stoichiometrically. So in other words, a full equivalent of each of these was required for each equivalent of the allylic alcohol. And the oxidizing agent, which is shown here, is tert-butyl hydroperoxide, or TBHP for short. Um, and that is the oxidizing agent. So if you remember, uh, peroxide is typically the type of reagent we use for doing an epoxidation reaction. But when we do it in an uh, in the presence of a chiral environment and with a chiral catalyst, we can do so enantioselectively. So here's some data from the 1980 article. Uh, it was by Sharpless and Katsuki. And uh, so you can see there's a variety here of allylic alcohols that were used. And here's the epoxy alcohol that was uh, generated, the chiral one. And what you'll notice is that um, even when there's two alkenes that are available, it's only the allylic alcohol that gets oxidized, that gets epoxidized. So here there's allylic alcohol, here's an allylic alcohol, so the other alkene is not reacting. And, um, and the others you can see are allylic alcohols as well, but they have some cis, they have trans, they have tri-substituted, so there's a, a nice variety of uh, allylic alcohols that were used. Uh, the yields are reasonable, and uh, the percent EE, the enantiomeric excess, um, is also quite good. And there were a couple methods that were used to determine the EE. This is always a challenge because, um, you know, uh, in every way, two, the, both enantiomers are identical. Um, and so how do we differentiate be between them and how do we determine what, um, whether or not our reaction occurred enantioselectively? And there are some very good uh, NMR methods and uh, Sharpless employed a few of them. One of them is to use a europium uh, reagent that's described as a shift reagent. So the acetate of the product was formed, so each of these epoxides was converted to the acetate. And then by using a shift reagent, um, it, causes the, um, it causes the chemical shifts to uh, move, the, the signals to move to different chemical shifts. And uh, if we add in enough of the shift reagent, we'll actually see we, the two um, enantiomers will resolve. And you can, you can then look at the integration of those peaks and determine what the ratio is. Uh, another method is uh, the M here. So you use for the europium method. And the M is for the using MTPA, also known as Mosher's ester. This is Mosher's acid. And so you, this is a chiral acid. And so if you combine that with the alcohol to make an ester, you've now made uh, diastereomers uh, when, you, when you combine them with both enantiomers. And so that's another way to um, identify each enantiomer in the NMR. So both of these methods were used to determine the EEs in this, um, in this article. Now how, do you, uh, how can you predict the product? Uh, of a Sharpless asymmetric epoxidation, or when you're planning a synthesis, how do you know which um, enantiomer of the 
dithyl tartrate to use because the plus enantiomer is the naturally occurring one. That's the structure down here. And um, this is prepared from tartaric acid, so it's much, much less expensive. And so uh, if it's possible to use that in your synthesis in any way, that would be great. Um, so if the alcohol, the allylic alcohol, is held in this orientation, so the, um, the alkene is kind of horizontal left to right, and the uh, CH2OH is down in this bottom right hand quadrant, then the rule is that the plus tartrate, the naturally occurring one, attacks from the top face, and I get the epoxide pointing up here or as a, as a wedge on this line drawing. Um, and if I use the opposite enantiomer, then um, I can actually select for the other um, enantiomer of the product. So that's the minus uh, diethyl tartrate. So that's how you can predict the product if you were um, looking to do use the Sharpless asymmetric epoxidation in a synthesis. Uh, in 1985, a this method was published in Organic Syntheses. Um, that's described as a publication of reliable methods for the preparation of organic compounds. So um, this this uh, procedure was published in 1985. You could go to the website orgsyn.org and you could search on uh, structure and see if uh, there's a procedure in there. But what they have is very detailed experimental procedures with very useful notes and advice and comments. Um, so procedures after they're developed they're submitted and they're actually checked before they're published so it's a great place to go for um, experimental procedures. Um, in this article in 1985 Sharpless noted some limitations of the method so uh, in one case if you have this is coming from the uh, dye substituted allylic alcohol and um, so if you have this generally dye substituted case you have a primary carbon right here and so that um, makes it somewhat susceptible to nucleophilic attack and so they had to be kind of careful with their workup and and handling this because it, it's uh, subject to ring opening. Um, in case two here if this Y group is something that would could stabilize a carbocation then again ring epoxide ring opening at carbon three can occur, can occur um, because that, that carbocation would be stabilized and then finally if you had a long if you had a chain here and somewhere off on that, at the end of that chain, five or six atoms away, if you had an um, atom that could be potentially nucleophilic, then that could um, cause an intramolecular um, ring opening. So those are some issues that had been encountered over the years that the, they had been um, working on this reaction. And then finally, it was noted that if you had very small epoxides, if there's only three or four carbon atoms, um, then those were typically water soluble and that made them difficult to isolate. In 1987, uh, Sharpless published a modified procedure and um, a big improvement that was made was by the use of molecular sieves um, that were zeolites and these were added to remove trace amounts of water because it was observed that water um, would deactivate the titanium catalyst and so, um, so that really helped make the reaction go much more efficiently. And um, in doing that, they were able to lower the amount of catalyst needed to just 5% of the titanium and a sl slightly more of the tartrate, but still um, a very small amount. So remember, it, it was stoichiometric when it was first introduced in 1980, and these um, optimized conditions uh, allows for much less catalyst being used. Um, he also developed procedures for doing a kinetic resolution if you had an allylic alcohol that was um, a racemic mixture then by doing these conditions you could epoxidize one of the enantiomers and then the other enantiomer would be um, would be recovered as the alcohol um, and so you would get the R alcohol out and the S alcohol would undergo the epoxidation so that's described as a kinetic resolution and that way you can utilize both enantiomers of a racemic alcohol. Uh, and he also came up with some solutions for those water soluble products uh, by derivatizing them in situ so as the product was formed instead of trying to isolate the allylic epoxide, I'm sorry, the um, epoxy alcohol in situ they determined they figured out ways to convert that alcohol to either the tosylate or maybe a sol ether or a, a benzoyl um, uh, paranitrobenzoyl uh, ester 
and so um, that would make it less water soluble and able to um, isolate. So here's some data from that article from 1987, the reference is up here, and um, so you could see again a lot of um, uh, examples, trans disubstituted uh, epoxides could be made, cis disubstituted alkenes as substrates, again that gem disubstituted, they kind of figured out how to do that in real good yields, real good EEs all across, uh, tri-substituted and so on. Uh, you could see that now they're adding sieves, either three or four angstrom sieves, um, even five angstrom sieves worked. And the um, catalyst is now down to you know, five and six percent. Notice again a slight excess of the uh, of the of the tartrate is required is works the best. Um, some reactions are a little slower, more difficult. They needed a higher amount of the catalyst, but still far far improved, um, much much more op better optimized than in the uh, when it was first introduced. And uh, a few different uh, tartrate esters. You could either use DET, which is the diethyl. Uh, tartrate or DIPT stands for diisopropyl tartrate so both of those work. Uh, you notice it here that it's at they're done at low temperatures to have uh, that that good control. Um, very quick typically quick reactions but here you can see the cis is slower um, and and uh, you know some some don't work at all and uh, again very good EEs are observed. Ideally for the trans those are the best. Um, so how is this working? There's a lot of research, of course, that went into um, trying to figure out what the structure of the catalyst uh, looks like. So in 91, this is an article by uh, Charvelis and Finn, just kind of showing how here we have our um, tartrate. This is the diisopropyl tartrate um, ester. And what's happening is the two alcohol groups on the tartrate are now um, adding to the complex of, about the titanium. Um, so that's how the titanium and the tartrate come together and it actually forms a dimer. So this is now an article from 1995 by Lei and Wu and it's showing the uh, dimer, uh, two titanium moieties and uh, here we have a one, two, three, four. Here's one of the tartrate esters. So the two alcohol groups are now complexed with the titaniums and one of the carbonyls is also reaching over and um, coordinating with the titanium. And then here's the other one, two, three, four, uh, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four carbons of the uh, second tartrate and both of the alcohol carbons are complexed as well as one of the carbonyls. Okay, so this is what the um, chiral catalyst looks like. We could see that it's complexing with the allylic alcohol here as well as the peroxide. Here's the two oxygens of the peroxide. This is a methyl, uh, methyl peroxide instead of a terpetyl peroxide. But, but then they model different ways of having the, um, the allylic alcohol complex in this direction or that direction. There was two other possibilities. And then uh, when they you know, brought everything together, this, this has a lot more, this is kind of a simplified drawing here, but when you add in everything, they determined that having the um, allylic alcohol in this orientation right here w had the uh, lowest energy that was the most stable and so that was the one that actually leads to the predicted product and now the peroxide delivers the oxygen to this face of the alkene preferentially and that's how we end up with the asymmetric um, synthesis. So let's just take a look at an application to um, a natural product synthesis. This is a structure of tautomycetin and it, it, it was isolated from soil bacteria. It was found to have antifungal and antibiotic activity. Um, and in addition now, it, uh, they've found there's inhibition of uh, colorectal and breast cancer cell growth and uh, might even have applications for as an immunosuppressor and organ transplantation. So, um, you know, a very uh, exciting, uh, biologically active natural product. And so uh, part of the synthesis is shown here. Uh, we have we're starting with uh, citronellol, which is a, um, a, bio, a, a natural I'm sorry a, a chiral natural product that's available as a as a readily available starting material. Citronellol is is used um, uh, citronellol, 
with with an alcohol here is actually what we use as an insect repellent and and it's isolated from um, from uh, the essential oil of roses and and some um, some ger geraniums so this is the aldehyde version of that we do they do a uh, Horner Wasworth Edmund uh, alkenylation here and uh, then reduce the ester to an alcohol and that's when they get the required allylic alcohol so remember that's the substrate and it's a trans so that makes it even better and uh, so here is our sharp Lasseri symmetric uh, epoxidation so they use the naturally occurring um, tartrate derivative to the diisopropyl tartrate and here's our uh, iso titanium isopropoxide, terbutyl hydroperoxide there's our molecular sieves, we're doing it at a, a cold temperature and uh, we get out the um, the epoxide uh, uh, because we're using the plus it's the it's the wedged epoxide coming from the top like the model we looked at before um, because this already has a chiral center we're not just we're not going to be um, reporting the uh, selectivity here in terms of enantiomeric excess because the two possible epoxides are actually going to be diastereomers of each other so what's shown here is the DR the diastereomeric ratio of 16 to 1 so highly selective for this you might wonder well if it's already chiral maybe we could expect some um, asymmetric induction from that chiral center but you know it's quite far away and it's it's not a group that could do any chelating or anything so um, it's really just relying on this uh, chiral catalyst to do the uh, selectivity so uh, thank you for joining me for a uh, brief introduction into the Sharpless asymmetric epoxidation reaction.